Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Sean and today we're going to talk about this situation that broke out in the New York City subway. Yes, we're going right back there after we just covered an incident where somebody hurled his girlfriend onto the tracks, severing what was originally reported as just her feet, but actually the most amount that she's going to keep in one of her legs because she lost both of them is just above the knee. So severing both of her legs because same day that I released that video, we had another instance where there was a shooting on the subway and I think it's after absolutely crucial that we analyze some of these videos, although I will note that I'm going to heavily redact them due to the fact that the YouTube gods have decided to punish my channel for showing things that, that other people can show just fine. But we're going to get into this after I thank everybody who signed up over at actualjusticewarrior.com slash join. Oh, give me the money. Give you give me the money. Okay. And remind you that on Saturday, April 27th, I will be at MindsFest, Austin, Texas. Link to tickets in the top of the description. So what you're hearing in the opening of this video is the 36-year-old man, the agitator, who is the black guy in this particular video, who appears to be shouting at another person, saying ridiculous things about this person maybe potentially being a migrant that beat up police officers. Although I do want to point out that on Twitter, I did think that the other guy was Latino, and it was based on the fact that I heard the voice of the female that I thought was with him, but those facts are ambiguous as of right now. But it appears that at this point in time, we're actually dealing with the Middle Eastern person. But regardless, this 36-year-old man, who is possibly and likely to be unbalanced, seems to believe that this guy needs to be turned over to the police because he attacked police officers in Times Square even though, I, I don't know, maybe he looks enough like one of those guys. You guys be the judge later on in the video when I show you this guy's images. <laughs> But anyway, point being, there are also racial comments made in there. This guy's saying that he hates your race and all that, and that's the reason why he's antagonizing this individual. And throughout the buildup to the point where they're actually fighting, he is saying that the guy he thinks is a Latino migrant, who, by the way, we don't know the immigration status of, but appears to be based on the name that is available to the public, a Middle Eastern person, is trying to bait him into throwing the first punch. Now, initially, the way I thought this story went is that they got into a fight the latino man ended up stabbing this black guy although again middle eastern man and then the black guy pulled out a gun and shot this man that stabbed him however that is not the case and when you go frame by frame on the video and then when you look at the news reports what you'll find out is something entirely different is happening rather than what is being reported in even more current articles because it appears you could see that when they finally start fighting and yes the black guy initiates the not only the verbal altercation, but the physical altercation, a unknown woman that we're not sure if she's with this person who is presumed to be Latino, but actually is Middle Eastern or not, pulls something out of her bag that we later discover is actually some kind of razor blade or knife or whatever. And if I were to play this video for you, you would actually see her go up to the back of this individual while he's on top of the Middle Eastern guy and stab him multiple times in his bag. Now, I'm going to link this New York Post video that has a bunch of different angles mashed up together. They do have some censorship in their video, but I'm not going to even try to show you still frames because there's blood and all that. So I'm going to play you some of the audio so you can understand what is going on post the stabbing. <laughs> Now, as you can see, this guy is saying, you stabbed me, you stabbed me. And if you actually watch the video, one of the things you'll notice is that he goes to a jacket that he later discarded. And in a very long and tenuous process, he ends up retrieving a firearm. And of course, because I first saw this from a different angle from passengers, I thought that this was going to be a situation where he ended up killing the person that he picked a fight with. You stab me? I'm gonna let you stab me. 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 I'm gonna let you stab me
And in fact, many people who are watching this video from this angle might have assumed the same because it's at this point in time that the person behind the camera decides that they should get the hell out of the situation. They end up fleeing and then we hear four shots from off camera being fired and then panic ensues. And by the way, this is something that I actually want to highlight more than this particular violent instance because I think it's absolutely crucial because when the people realize that they're trapped in a train cart with possibly an active gunman, all of a sudden their true feelings about situations end up coming out, including a woman desperately crying out for the NYPD in what is a gut-wrenching kind of moment. <laughs> Now, I had pointed out at the time that I saw this video immediately before I had all the information that this woman should ask her city council person, their state representative, whoever they need to ask in government where the NYPD is because policies implemented by de Blasio and continued by the state level and by Eric Adams, despite his promises during the campaign, have led to a 7,000 officer shortage in the NYPD. And one of the things that they've clearly and obviously pulled back on is is enforcement against things like fare evasion that end up preempting these kinds of people from entering the subway in the first place. Now, I said this without any additional information at all whatsoever. I said this completely out of speculation with no idea if we would ever learn the truth of whether or not one or both of these individuals ended up paying for the subway. But the thing is, we have the video, it turns out one of them didn't, and this is what I've been saying over and over again on this channel, which is this is a key way to get criminals out of the subway system because the unbalanced guy that starts an argument with a random Middle Eastern person and then gets into a physical altercation and then pulls out a gun likely is not going to have any qualms about not paying a $2.90 fare in order to get into the subway. Had you had fare enforcement, had you not decided that that was just criminalizing poverty, you could have stopped this person, arrested him for that, found the illegal gun, because according to him, he's been in prison for 13 years, meaning he's a felon in a possession of a firearm, not to mention legally possessing a gun is damn near impossible in the city of New York anyway, and this shooting likely never would have happened. This fight likely never would have happened, and this guy, by the way, that they let through, the innocent angel victim, the mentally ill person, as Eric Adams describes him. Middle of the afternoon and a busy time time. The data doesn't lie. Just 62 days into 2024 and we have tied the number of subway shooting victims that we saw in all of 2023. Wow. That is pretty astounding. But we're also already halfway to last year's total number of subway shooting incidents. The number of incidents. Would have never gotten himself shot in the head. But to jump back to that cart where everybody's crowding down in the subway station. The reason they're doing this is because the train was actually in motion while this was going on. And there's actually earlier video from different angles of people fleeing the subway platform. But the thing is, after the shots were fired by the Middle Eastern guy, he ended up fleeing the scene because, you know, obviously scared, chaotic, whatever. And people didn't realize what went down. They just saw somebody who's coming from the direction of the shots. They might have seen him engaging in the fight. They might have even seen him pull the trigger just because we don't see it on the video doesn't mean that they didn't see it. So they thought that this individual was an active shooter. And what ended up happening? happening. These people were terrified. They huddled, trapped in a tin can, and they were begging for the NYPD to show up. And by the way, the station that they pulled into actually has a police precinct right there. So the police were able to respond very quickly in this situation. But this is the difference between reactive policing and proactive policing. A proactive policing model would be addressing the record number of dollars that we're losing in our subway system by elevated fare evasion and also so using that as an opportunity to run people for warrants, to check people for illegal weapons, to make sure they never get into the interior of the city in the first place. Again, we 
William Bratton discovered this when he was the head of the MTA Transit Police back in the late 80s, and he found at that time that one out of every seven people that they arrested for jumping the turnstiles popped for a felony warrant. That means automatically they had a felony warrant that they were not being held accountable on that they were able to discover and keep them from entering the city, and it not only reduced crime in the subway, which used to be horrible in the city of New York, way worse than it is right now, but it reduced crime in the overall city of New York because that's how these criminals were getting themselves in. And since we've removed this, since we pulled back on this, since the de Blasio administration decided that he was going to go with whatever Black Lives Matter asked with, we have had more murders in the subway since 2020 than we had in the previous 15 years. And it's only going up. We have had a series of high profile crimes that have shaken the security of New Yorkers. Statistically, it's not what it used to be. It's better, much better. But I'm not going to talk about statistics. I'm going to talk about feelings and emotions and the psychology of a city. Now, I also want to point out that I told you in my previous video where we discussed the National Guard situation and Governor Kathy Hochul saying that she wants to address the perception of crime and how she was sending them to do random bag searches, that that wasn't going to do anything. I want more people on the subways. We're not quite back to the pre-pandemic levels. And if people are feeling unsafe and won't come, then I have to do something about it because the problem is and the entry point where you could intervene and prevent these people from committing crimes is fair evasion we know this we have designed interventions in the past in order to do this it absolutely worked but all these dopey progressives want to ignore that and pretend like it's the equivalent or it's the same exact thing to randomly search old ladies bags so that you don't seem disproportionately racist with the national guard when that's not going to do anything the entire point of developing interventions in the criminal justice system is to actually have a positive impact. Kathy Hochul's entire perception of what the police and the National Guard are there for is to trick you into believing things are safer while she's in denial of the actual danger that exists. Now, a lot of these high-minded progressives in New York City and across the country will look you dead in the face in the face of rising subway crime that we can see by the numbers and say, don't worry about it. It's a rare occurrence this isn't a big deal when you compare the amount of crime in the subway the amount of murders specifically to to the subway versus the riders it's it's extraordinarily low you only have like one in a million chance of being murdered so don't worry about it it's no big deal just move along and shut up as if we don't see the numbers as if we don't notice that more people have been killed in less than four years since the institution of their policies than the previous 15 years as if we haven't heard of about subway crime rising in all these other categories, as if people can't see the decay in the subways when they actually ride it. You know, when I was maybe 24 years old, 25, 26, and I was in university, I would take the train to school all the time. It wasn't like this. Sure, it was dirty. Sure, there was occasionally some problems, some fights, but the fact of the matter is they had fair evasion enforcement, and that kept a lot of the bad people out of the subway, and those people were weren't committing crazy crimes. And when they did commit those crimes, they could actually be held accountable. When you combine terrible policies like not enforcing fair evasion with bail reform, which lets people out same day with an automatic release, with policies like less is more, which make it impossible to violate somebody's probation or parole, which by the way, is the whole point of probation or parole. Behave this way, you get to be out. Don't behave this way, we throw your ass back in. And you have things like raise the age, these create a recipe for absolute disaster. I don't know how much more clear I can make this. When you tell the criminal population that they can keep reoffending over and over again, and you're not going to do anything until maybe it gets to murder. Although in that case that we covered just a day ago, the guy was allowed to attempt murder four times before he actually faced consequences. That's what you're going to get. Criminals that are going to escalate to the point where someone dies. That's not the way that things should be. We know how to do things differently. We know what needs to be changed. We know what needs to be implemented, but we don't have the political will to do it. Kathy Hochul would rather talk about how the National Guard should be there, but also we should take away the weapons of the National Guard because I don't know if you guys know this, their weapons are kind of scary. And I think you guys would be a lot more scared of the National Guard carrying the weapons you would expect the military to carry rather than these random psychos.
psychopaths pulling guns, stabbing, getting stabbed, all this craziness that's going on in the subway. Again, we're not even through three months in the year, and we already have a bunch of insane high-profile attacks in the subway. Crime is up dramatically in the subway just this year, and we're still pretending like it's not a problem. We still got Eric Adams saying, oh, mental illness, mental illness. But also, very crucially, it turns out that the guy who was able to wrestle the gun away from this person fire four shots, including two shots, I think, that connected with the black guy who started the fight. He's not being charged because he has a right to self-defense, which I find to be incredibly interesting because Daniel Penny was not afforded that same right. But now we have two different cases where somebody is afforded that right to self-defense, even though Daniel Penny wasn't. And I wonder what the black guy who stabbed the guy who got out of jail, who was attacking him and his girlfriend and this Middle Eastern guy appear, appear to have in common or more importantly, what they are not because they're not white. And it seems like if you're not white, you do have the right to self-defense. Thankfully, I do think people should have the right to self-defense. But if you are white, like Daniel Penny, your right to self-defense is null and void. To the point where two other people who helped Daniel Penny restrain Jordan Neely in that particular instance, two other people who by all accounts of the law should be just as criminally culpable in that situation for assisting in the restraint, we're also not charged. We're also not prosecuted. Again, interesting how that works. Now, I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Is it interesting that this person is also a fair and you could have intercepted him at that point in time, popped him for the felon in possession of a firearm, or should we just let chaos run amok? Because God forbid we have any intervention at all whatsoever. As usual, if you like this video, then show him by leaving a like, subscribe for more content, follow me on my social medias, support me via the support links in the description of this video. This has been me talking about chaos in the New York City subways. Till next time.